Today we're here with Chris Cave, Director of R&D for Interdigital, and we're going to talk about the path from LTE to 5G. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. Thanks, uh, Claudia, for, uh, for having me. So let's start with Spectrum. Spectrum seems to be one of the big hurdles that faces 5G. So can you walk us through the challenges here and how you see this discussion evolving? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, it could be a hurdle or also an opportunity. So uh, as, as uh, we've seen from a lot of the 5G research being done, we, we expect that uh, 5G systems will need to operate in new spectrum, both above 6 gigahertz and below 6 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really need to target a significant amount of new spectrum to meet all of the uh, anticipated 5G demands. So um, what we like to do is sort of uh, look at things in, uh, above and below uh, independently. So if I take a quick look above 6 gigahertz, uh, this is where you have really a, um, a sort of a large chunks of spectrum available in centimeter wave and millimeter wave frequencies. And this is where we think you can achieve these very high bandwidths, uh, very high, high data rates required to meet some of the uh, ultra mobile broadband um, needs for indoor and hotspot access. Um, the challenge above six gigahertz, however, is that um, those frequencies do experience very different propagation characteristics compared to the existing cellular spectrum that we're used to operating in below six gigahertz. Um, and so we're going to have to design systems that can actually operate efficiently in, in those bands, take full advantage of that spectrum, and so on. Um, there are some techniques such as uh, spatial processing, massive antenna arrays, which will likely be fundamental parts of spectrum above six gigahertz to really enable us to overcome some of the, the more challenging propagation characteristics. But the advantage of operating in such higher frequencies is that you can design much smaller antenna systems and, and actually implement some massive antenna arrays to, to, to help out there. Um, I think that's one of the sort of the technical challenges that we'll have to, to see and, and, and make sure that we can design for, for spectrum above 6 gigahertz. The other challenge is in identifying a spectrum that can be used um, on a global basis, right? Um, uh, in terms of spectrum above 6 gigahertz, we're a little further behind as an industry in terms of identifying specific bands uh, where, where we could operate. Um, looking ahead at some of the uh, efforts going on with the World Radio Conf Con Conference 2015 and 2019, uh, we expect that the above 6 gigahertz discussion will take place um, at World Radio Con Conference 2019. So that's really, I guess, the point where we'll have a, a, a finalized picture of what spectrum could be used for IMT service above 6 gigahertz. Uh, looking below 6 gigahertz is maybe a little more familiar picture, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we're used to operating in, in you know, lower, lower bands in the 2 gigahertz range, 3.5 and so on with, with LTE systems. And uh, we do believe, however, that for 5G, we will have some new spectrum available as well. And some of that will hopefully be identified at this World Radio Conference 2015 towards the end of this year. And so in terms of spectrum below 6 gigahertz, there's really two opportunities. There's new spectrum there, and then there's leverage, leveraging existing spectrum, right? So in the new spectrum, um, we have an opportunity to design a, a new radio access technology there that's non-backwards compatible. Uh, that can really be used to, to help us meet some of the 5G use cases and needs that existing LTE systems are not able to, to, to satisfy. But we also have existing spectrum there that has been deployed for LTE or 4G services. And that's a very good spectrum. It's already got a very good technology and operators will want to continue leveraging that. And so we see that we anticipate LTE will continue to evolve in, it, in the existing 4G spectrum and will be a key component of 5G systems. Okay, so great segue into the next question, which is about the evolution of LTE. So as LTE continues to evolve towards 5G, what will be the key advancements that we'll see in the LTE side of the discussion? Right, well, LTE has, uh, w was introduced um, back in what we call 3GPP Release 8 and has actually evolved significantly, significantly since then. Uh, right now, the 3GPP community is actually standardizing Release 13, and, and we expect that uh, you know, some of the features being introduced in Release 13 will, themselves will continue to evolve with, with the addition of new features for Releases 14, 15, and 16. 
which will sort of be, as I said, a, a key part of 5G. So uh, if we want to dig into a few of these, one, one example is using LTE and unlicensed spectrum, right? Uh, um, mm -hmm. This idea of LAA or license assisted access is a, an important new feature uh, for LTE where we're, we're enabling use of LTE networks in uh, unlicensed spectrum and making sure that it can coexist with other technologies there. It's a really great way for operators to leverage an additional spectrum at a low cost of, of using that lower cost of using that spectrum. Uh, we see uh, the introduction of, of um, advanced spatial processing uh, techniques such as full dimensional MIMO or 3D beam forming being used for LTE in future releases going up to uh, up to 64 antenna ports possibly in, in one or two releases from now. Device-to-device uh, -device communication is, is a feature that was introduced originally in release 12 but continues to evolve uh, and we, we anticipate will continue in itself to evolve over a few more releases. That, that's really a, a sort of a change of a paradigm shift for LTE where devices are allowed to communicate directly with each other rather than going through the infrastructure network and, and that enables a whole sort of new set of services for LTE, namely the whole public safety um, type market that, that um, governments and, and, and are trying to, to find a new technology for. Uh, also new services like VDUX, the vehicles communicating with each other. That is a, an important new set of features that 3GPP will address as well based off of device-to-device uh, -device communications. Mm -hmm. Um, we see even tighter integration of LTE with other technologies, so Wi-Fi being a candidate there, uh, being able to bring in uh, aggregation of other technologies at a, a deeper level into the radio network, a number of protocol enhancements to reduce latency and so on, and then finally, as I mentioned, LTE being a key component of uh, 5G systems, we, we think that in the early phases of 5G systems, LTE will be seen as sort of the base connectivity layer, right, with new technology coming in as a sort of a capacity enhancement for the mobile broadband case. And so we'll have to, we'll have to design this uh, multi-layer connectivity framework within future LTE systems. Okay. And what will be the main infrastructure differences between LTE and 5G? Oh, well, there, there's a, a number of, of, of potential ways of, of sort of redesigning the infrastructure. The main thing that uh, we see happening is uh, a much more flexible and fluid infrastructure, the concepts such as virtualization, mm -hmm. uh, which are very important uh, these days to, to sort of optimize the way networks run. Um, on the RAN side, specifically looking at the, the radio access network, we have the concept of cloud RAN that comes in where um, a lot of the processing is done in a more central location and, and, uh, and then we have, uh, could be connected through remote radio heads at the endpoints, uh, but we could also envision different splits of the protocol stack being possible where we bring, uh, you know, different functionally in the central processing, functionality in this central processing versus in these edge nodes, which mm -hmm. are called uh, base stations. Um, one of the key things that sort of this virtualized virtualization enables or cloud ran is to define, uh, I guess, a more flexible way of addressing new services across the network, right? We could define these network slices per service mm -hmm. that can enable us to actually um, sort of bring on these, these network slices on demand based on on service demand. Okay. Great. And just one last question. Um, everyone's talking about 5G and use cases. And when you were talking about network slices, that's, that's a, a good lead into this topic also, because I've seen people talking about slices defined to specific use cases. So maybe you could give one or two examples of use cases that you see that 5G is applicable for and how that might work. Great. Yeah. So use cases are really obviously an important thing for 5G. Um, I think uh, compared to previous generations, which have focused mostly on, on a, a smaller number of use cases, 5G is being sort of uh, thought of now as, 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 as everything you could imagine that could benefit from a wireless connection. A lot of different uh, industry forms have started to identify use cases. Uh, and, and so uh, I can, you know, as an example, NGNM has put together a good set of use cases for 5G. But um, when you look at all these use cases, it can almost give you a headache when it comes to trying to figure out how you 
would design a system to support these use cases. So one of the ways that we've gone about this is try to simplify things a little bit and group them into two distinct buckets. And so um, we like to think of the first set of use cases as being the sort of 5G mobile broadband use cases. And that's those are sort of characterized as uh, overall higher performance targets across the board compared to what we have in 4G, right? So higher data rates, lower latency, and so on. Really enhancing the, uh, the sort of mobile user's experience, providing new services to the mobile user. And this really targets these high capacity indoor or hotspot type deployments. Uh, the second set of use cases, the second group that we have would be this 5G for the connected world. And uh, this one would be characterized by having native support for use cases that have very divergent requirements. And this is where one of the big 5G challenges lies, is that we need to support these new services that actually have very different characteristics to them, right? And I guess you could look at it um, to, to two sort of ends of the spectrum. On one end, you have these massive number of connected devices that have low power requirements, low data rate, low complexity requirements, very uh, inexpensive modems that uh, may need to be autonomous for a 10 to 15 year period. That would be sort of on one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum, you would have the, the uh, ultra, ultra uh, low latency, ultra high reliability type service which would require extremely low um, uh, latency in the order of uh, you know, well below one millisecond, um, uh, very high reliability and high service availability. Uh, this could target uh, some services such as autonomous driving, uh, some of the public safety type services, and so anything sort of what we call these mission critical type services. And so you, you can imagine that those two extremes that I just painted actually have very different um, requirements and would lead to sort of very different transmission characteristics. And so what we're trying to do in 5G is design a system that could actually have those services coexist in the same spectrum. And that's a very important point because we, we, we would make sure, we, we believe that operators um, would not want to dedicate spectrum to any one service. They want to have the ability to multiplex these services in the same spectrum that they have operated in. And so that's one of the challenges that, that lies ahead, I think, for us in 5G, mm -hmm. uh, is, is to make sure we can make uh, these, these, divergent, these services having divergent requirements coexist together in the same spectrum. Okay. Great, Chris. This is really interesting. I really enjoyed listening to you talk through these questions. So thanks again for taking the time to spend with RCR Wireless News today. Thank you very much, Claudia. Have a great day. Thanks. You too.